I would like to begin the class with my favorite quote on Walt Whitman. Ezra Pound said of Walt Whitman, he is America. I repeat, he is America. But I feel that Ezra Pound was not wholly right. After reading Song of Myself, we can conclude of Walt Whitman, he is the world. And if you focus critical attention on Song of Myself 32, frequently titled Animals, you will be compelled to arrive at the conclusion He is the universe. I repeat, He is the universe. Song of Myself is precisely what its title suggests. Song of Walt Whitman himself. The long poem which was included in Leaves of Grass is an invitation to the reader to dissect the identity of Walt Whitman, to share the perspectives of Walt Whitman, to comprehend the forces that drive Walt Whitman, the poet, and Walt Whitman, the human being, to realize that Walt Whitman though very much an individual is equally part of the universe in which Walt Whitman as well as the reader is located. It is one of the most well-known, one of the most acclaimed works of verse to emanate from the American continent. It embodies the core of Whitman's poetic vision and uh, some years back, I think it was a decade back, J. Perini, J. Perini called Song of Myself the greatest American poem ever written. Song of Myself 32 occupies a pivotal position in the corpus of Walt Whitman. Editors of anthologies, editors of textbooks, sometimes title it animals. It expresses a crucial part of the vision, of the philosophical vision, of the poetic vision of the philanthropic vision of the poet. The philanthropy of the poet, the philosophy of the poet, the poetry of the poet goes well beyond humankind. The poem makes it clear that 
the speaker feels a tremendous kinship with animals. The poem is of extraordinary topical significance today because we now speak of the rights of animals, not merely the rights of animals, but of the human rights of animals. This earth rightly belongs not merely to humanity, but to all life. And it is this conviction that provides the tremendous strength, the overwhelming strength that the poem enjoys. How can human beings claim soul exclusive ownership of the earth? The earth belongs to animals as much as to humans. In general, over the centuries, over thousands of years, human culture has developed a tendency to look, to look down upon animals, to say that animals are animals, after all, they are not human. They hold that they are inferior to human beings. But the speaker in the poem makes it clear that he believes that not just that animals are not inferior to human beings, but that they are in fact superior to human beings. The speaker feels a powerful kinship with animals. He is convinced that in many ways they are much better than human beings. He is quite comfortable with animals. In fact, it would appear that he would rather be animal than human. Let us try to carry out a line by line analysis of the poem. I think I could turn and live with animals. Look at the very first word of the very first line of the section. I. It is very much in sync with the title of the poem, Song of Myself. How does the poet begin the section? I, the pronoun I, the singular pronoun I, the first person singular pronoun I, which is used to refer to oneself by a speaker to refer to himself. I. What does the poet say? What does the speaker say? He could turn and live with animals. What is an animal? A living thing which is not a human being, which is not a plant. A living thing which is not a human being, not a plant. It could be a reptile, it could be a bird, it could be an insect, animal. Of course, it can be a mammal. An animal is, a, is an organism, a living organism which feeds on organic matter, which has a nervous system, which typically has specialized sense organs, and which is able 
to respond to stimuli quickly. What does the speaker say? He could very much turn and live with animals. In general, down the centuries, human beings have always thought or almost always thought to be, thought themselves to be superior to animals. Civilizations are built by humans, not by animals. And one of the meanings, one of the numerous meanings of the word animal is a wild, aggressive, unpleasant person. My father-in-law is a real animal. It is in this context that the speaker says that he would very much like to turn and live with animals. This is a revolutionary line. This is a revolutionary concept in the history of American literature. A poet saying that he wants to live with animals. A poet refusing to look down upon animals. A poet identifying himself with animals. A poet discovering a special kinship with animals. It is not for nothing that we say that Walt Whitman is one of the most original poets ever. I think that this is for the first time, this idea of a man discovering a kinship with animals, identifying himself with animals, wanting to live with animals, proclaiming that he is very comfortable with animals. This idea is being expressed for the very first time in the history of American literature. They are so placid and self-contained, I stand and look at them long and long. Placid means calm, serene, not this, uh, not easily upset and not easily excited, undisturbed, self-contained, containing everything within itself. But when we say that a person is, person is self-contained, we mean that 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 person has very few relationships, is independent is not easily influenced by others, lives rather in isolation, interacts very little with other people. That's how the speaker sees animals. They're placid, they're calm. Human beings get excited quickly. They also get upset quickly. They're easily disturbed, but animals are placid. They're self-contained, they're independent. They don't require the support of others. They're emotionally self-contained. So what does the speaker do? He stands and looks at them long and long. He enjoys the experience of gazing at the animals. He stands and looks at them long and long. How different are the animals? How different are the animals from human beings? Human beings are easily excited, easily upset. And some of us suffer from bipolar disorder. On certain days we experience highs unreasonably and on certain days we experience lows equally unreasonably. 
But look at the animals. They're calm, they're serene, they're placid, they're self-contained. They don't require the emotional support of others. They are not easily influenced by others. They are not, uh, they don't require interaction with others. I am reminded of the famous opening lines of leisure, the well-known poem by the Welsh poet W. H. Davies. What is this life, a full of care? We have no time to stand and stare. The speaker in the Whitman poem is obviously a person who is able to find the time to stand and stare. They do not sweat and whine about their condition. The first thing that the speaker finds attractive about animals is that they do not sweat and whine about their condition. Sweat is moisture exuded through the pores of the skin. In that case it's a noun. But the word sweat can be used as a verb to mean discharge sweat to exude moisture through the pores of the skin, to perspire. There is the saying, genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. Wine is a high-pitched complaining cry, especially a cry, such a cry made by a dog. In that case, it's a noun again. But wine can be used as verb, as a verb, to give a high-pitched complaining cry. In this specific context, sweat and wine means to complain, to complain constantly to complain pitifully about their condition, their state. In fact, I think the poet is spot on. Almost all people are dissatisfied with their state, with their condition. There's hardly anyone in this world who is without complaints. The human condition is such that we are all dissatisfied, we are all unhappy and sometimes, at least some of us, we are all jealous and we have always complaints. The difference between animals and human beings is that human beings have complaints all the time about their state, about their condition, but animals do not sweat and whine regarding their state, regarding their condition. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. The reference here is to the emotion of guilt, or more accurately, to what is known in psychology, in psychiatry, as a guilt complex. A guilt complex can cause sleeplessness, insomnia. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins, weep to shed tears. Again, Walt Whitman is spot on. This is precisely 
what human beings do, especially human beings in the Christian world. Because the Christian religion sees every human being as a sinner, children of sin. That is what humanity consists of. And what is sin? Sin is an immoral act, a wrong, especially a religious wrong, a transgression against divine law. And from the Christian perspective, because of what Eve did, what, because of what Adam did under the influence of Eve in the Garden of Eden, we are all sinners. That is the original sin. And we have also the personal sin. Every human being from the Christian perspective constantly commits sins. The Christian religion attempts to generate a guilt complex in its adherents, in its members. And as a result of the feeling that they have sinned, Human beings lie awake, they are unable to sleep, they suffer from anxiety, they suffer from insomnia, they suffer from depression, and they cry, they weep, they shed tears at night. This is something that animals do not do. They do not make me sick discussing their duty. To God. This is indeed a powerful line. Sick means not well, ill. But I think in this context the poet uses the word to mean nauseous, having a feeling of nausea. You feel as if you are going to vomit. The poet feels as if he is going to vomit. The poet has a feeling of nausea when he hears people discussing their duty to God. It would appear that God has no business except to impose duty upon human beings. That is how conventional religions interpret man's relationship with God. Whenever the speaker hears others discussing duty to God, man's duty to God, he feels sick. Please do not jump to the conclusion that Walt Whitman was an atheist that he did not believe in God. I would invite you to read his poem, Gods, read his poem, Gods, in order to get an idea of the concept of God cherished by Walt Whitman. I think it, it is fairly accurate to say that Walt Whitman accepted all sources, but believed in none. He certainly believed in God, but his concept of God, especially as expressed in his poem, Gods, is very different from the conventional, traditional concept of God proclaimed by the various forms of Christianity, the various ch Christian churches. No one is dissatisfied. That is one of the fundamental problems with human beings. We are all dissatisfied. We may be rich, we may be poor, we may be powerful, we may be powerless. Whatever be our condition, we are not happy with it. 
we are dissatisfied. The contrast is between the human race, the members of the human race who are always dissatisfied and animals who have no sense of dissatisfaction. A somewhat similar idea is expressed by Robert Browning in Rabbi Ben Ezra. Rabbi Ben Ezra stanza 4, if I'm not wrong. In fact, the last line of stanza 4. Irks care the cropful bird, frets doubt the more cramped beast. Let me try to repeat it. Irks care the cropful bird, frets doubt the more crammed beast. Not one is demented with the mania of owning things. Demented means mad, crazy, insane. Mania means mental illness. Or um, it can be interpreted to mean an excessive or obsessive interest which occupies one's time, one's mind, one's life in an unreasonably excessive manner. I think uh, the poet makes a very pertinent point. This is particularly true in consumerist cultures like the culture of the United States, the mania for owning things. This is not to mean that the Indians are far behind their American brothers and sisters in the matter. We have come to think that more possessions, more possessions means more happiness. But the fact is not true. We are all demented, insane, overcome by the mania for possession, for possessing things. This is not going to take us anywhere. In fact, all religions speak against the excessive interest in material possessions. Advaita Vedanta one of the mainstream schools of Hindu philosophy discusses the immateriality of all material reality through the Maya principle. Jesus Christ spoke again and again against the desire for material possessions. He exclaimed, Behold the fowls of the air. Look at the birds of the sky. They sow not, they reap not, they gather not in barns. In fact, he seemed to believe that to be a rich man is to be a sinner. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. He advocated the use of the bare minimum, the very minimum of material possessions. If you have two coats, give one coat to the man who does not have a coat. It may be observed that it is one of the axioms of modern psychology, modern psychiatry, that materialistic people are generally more unhappy 
and more depressed than people who are not materialistic. No one kneels to another. Karl Marx prophesied a classless society. Mahatma Gandhi also shared the dream of Karl Marx to create a classless society. The poet's point here is that what is only a distant dream for human beings has already been created by animals. Animals live in a classless society. No animal kneels to another animal. To kneel means to fall on one's knees, to take a body position in which the weight of the body rests on one knee or on both knees. To kneel before someone means to worship that someone, to give extreme respect to that someone, to supplicate. Subjects are expected or were expected to kneel before their sovereign. The point that Walt Whitman makes is that there is no custom of one animal kneeling before another animal. Animals live in a society in which all are equal, a classless society, very much like the society desired and dreamt of by Karl Marx and Mahatma Gandhi. No to his kind that lived thousands of years ago. This could be a reference to ancestor worship, to the tradition of worshipping one's remote ancestors, remote ancestors who lived thousands of years earlier Ancestor worship was common or is common in certain parts of the world like China, like India, like Africa. But when you take into consideration the fact that the poem originates from a Christian society, it could very well be a reference, an allusion at least, to Jesus Christ who died some 2,000 years before the poet, some 2,000 years before Walt Whitman. And who is worshipped as the Son of God by Christians and God the Son by Christians who kneel while worshipping. I think this is a better interpretation, a better reading. No one is respectable or unhappy over the whole earth. Respectable means socially acceptable, considered by society to be worthy of respect, considered by other people to be correct, proper, right, deserving respect. Unhappy, of course, means not happy, sad, sorrowful. 
just as human beings occupy the entire earth or much of the entire earth animals also occupy much of the entire earth but even if you even if you conduct a detailed survey you will never be able to come across an animal which is respectable an animal which is unhappy all animals are equally respectable and equally happy one of the great things in human society supposedly great things in human society is that some people are looked upon as respectable while others are not there is no such distinction in the animal world similarly you find a lot of unhappy people i think most of us are unhappy you cannot come across unhappy animals what a heavenly life they lead and what a contrast to the life led by human beings in the lines that follow the poet explains that animals bring him memories of himself they bring him tokens the lines are rather ambiguous perhaps the best interpretation would be to see them as an illusion to darwin's charles darwin's darwin's theory of evolution the poet's point is that animals remind him of the human condition before they became human they bring tokens to him tokens from a distant past the poet seems to believe that when human beings left the animal condition and reached the human condition they lost much they degraded themselves and the poet now feels that animals bring bring him elements from his own remote past the past which was glorious in contrast to the present the animals demonstrate their relations to him and he accepts them it would appear that the speaker is able to identify himself better with animals than with fellow human beings the animals bring tokens to the speaker tokens are indications especially small indications representing things which are frequently vast and frequently not so tangible events means show display make something obvious the speaker says that the animals bring him tokens of himself as he was millions of years ago and they display these tokens in a very direct in a very obvious in a very simple in a very plain manner the speaker is thus reminded of his own state millions of years ago and it appears to the speaker this is what he suggests this is what he indirectly says it appears to the speaker that he was in a much better condition than millions of years ago 
than he is now. The speaker wonders where the animals get the tokens from. Probably the speaker himself dropped them huge times ago, millions of years ago. The contrast is between the human being moving forward with great speed, with great velocity, evolving from the animal, becoming very much human and taking human civilization allegedly forward at extraordinary speed and the animal remaining where the human being was millions of years ago in the evolutionary journey. There is the subtext that the development, the dramatic development, the spectacular development, the extraordinary journey of human evolution and human civilization is ultimately not, not worth what it is usually considered to be worth. It seems to appear that the human journey is infinite. The remarkable and remarkably fast human journey of evolution and civilization is infinite and omnigenous. It appears that, or it seems to appear that, this journey will never ever end. It also seems to appear that in this journey of evolution and civilization, the human being will constantly be capturing everything that comes his way, integrating everything that comes his way to himself, transforming himself, modifying himself, changing himself, and consequently moving further and further away from the world of animals. However, the speaker makes it clear that this journey of evolution, this journey of civilization cannot prevent him, cannot prevent the speaker from identifying his bond with animals, from identifying his fraternal relationship with animals, from expressing his brotherly love towards animals. I would like to pause for a moment and observe that the three most important thematic strands in Song of Myself are one, the self, two, the relationship between the self and other selves, and three, the relationship between the self and nature. It is the last of these thematic strands, the thematic strand of the relationship between the self and nature, that 
assumes predominance in this section. We now come to the most impressive part of the section where the poet uses his pen to paint the picture of a horse, a stallion. A stallion is a male horse for breeding, an uncastrated male horse. And as we read the lines, we find the huge creature, the stallion, standing right in front of us with its high head, its broad forehead, its smooth and shiny skin, its long tail touching the ground almost, its gracefully moving limbs, its mischievous eyes, its sparkling eyes, its flexible ears. And we have before us a picture of power, of grace, of beauty, of potential speed, of majesty which has few parallels in American poetry. The picture reminds us of the fact that Walt Whitman was a keen observer of nature, a lover of nature, a poet who was able to capture the grandeur, the greatness of nature in all its glory in his work. There is no doubt that the most famous painter of horses in India is M. of Hussein, the controversial painter M. of Hussein, who is looked upon as the greatest artist of his generation by his admirers, and who is denounced as a charlatan by his detractors. The lines do not merely contain the portrait of an animal, of a horse, of a stallion. They contain the picture of a relationship, the relationship between the stallion and a speaker. It is not just a stallion but a stallion which is responsive to the caresses of the speaker. A caress is a touch or a stroke which is an expression of love, of affection, of caring. And here, as I said, the real picture is not merely of an animal in isolation, but of the relationship between the animal and the speaker. The stallion is responsive, it responds positively, it makes it clear that it comprehends the love of the speaker, the affection of the speaker, and, uh, and acts in a positive manner towards it. The love of the speaker, the, res the, the affection of the speaker which is expressed through the caresses. So what we find here is not the picture of an animal in isolation, but the picture of a bond between man and animal. We should not forget this aspect of the picture. The stallion, of course, is a personification, 
of power, of grace, of majesty. But even more than that, it is capable of expressing its relationship with the speaker, its kinship with the speaker, who expresses his love, his affection for the animal by caressing it. I would like to pause for a moment and observe that Song of Myself, section 32, is one of the finest equestrian pieces of verse in the English language. In English poetry, we do have some sensational horse poems. And the 32nd section of Song of Myself invites comparison with them. I have in mind such extraordinary pieces as On the Horse and His Rider by John Bunyan. Horses and Men in Rain of Carl Sandburg at Grass by Philip Larkin and of course the High Women of Alfred Noyes. In the penultimate stanza the relationship between man and animal between speaker and stallion goes a few steps forward. Earlier the stallion had responded positively to the caresses bestowed upon him by the poet. But now the speaker rides the stallion. There is a, there is a union between man and animal, between speaker and stallion, a union which is close, physical, sensual. Earlier, the speaker had caressed the horse and the horse had responded positively to the caresses. Now the speaker sits on the horse embraces the horse with his heels and races around both man and animal, both speaker and stallion immerse themselves in the joy, in the pleasure of, in the thrill of the race, the nostrils of the horse dilate as they, the speaker on the stallion, speaker and stallion, as they race around. This is a striking picture of the joy the thrill, the glamour of the, of the equestrian. When we reach the closure of the section, we come across a rather unexpected twist in the thematic trajectory of the poem. There is no doubt that the speaker enjoys 
racing around on the stallion. But that is not the end of the story. The union between man and horse, between speaker and stallion, is close, physical, sensual, but it lasts only a minute and then the speaker gives up the stallion. I but use you a minute, then I resign you, stallion. Then I resign you, stallion. The speaker feels that he no longer needs the horse because he does not desire to put an end to his onward journey at this particular stage. The speaker does not need the horse because he can, the speaker can out gallop the horse. The speaker can beyond, go beyond, go beyond the horse while the speaker stands or the speaker sits. He moves faster than the stallion and goes beyond the stallion. In the sciences, especially in mathematics, there is something called an open question or an open problem. A question which is very clearly articulated and which is supposed to have a definite answer, but the answer is yet to be arrived at. There is a question, the question has an answer, but we are yet to reach the answer. I think that something like that can be said about the closure of section 32 of Song of Myself. What does the poet mean when he says that he will out gallop the galloping stallion? Why do I need your paces when I myself out gallop them? Even as I stand or sit, passing faster than you. What exactly does the poet mean when he says this? Perhaps it is again a reference to the evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin. Man has evolved to this stage. And the speaker says that there is no intention of remaining at this stage. He will evolve even further. It took millennia to reach this stage. Very true. But this is not the end of the journey. The evolution process will continue further and that is precisely what the speaker desires. A second interpretation could be that the lines allude to a philosophical and a spiritual evolution rather than a physical and a biological evolution. It is true that the speaker has evolved to this particular stage where he is able to feel a remarkable kinship, an amazing kinship with the stallion. But that is not the end of the story. He will evolve further in his philosophical journey in his spiritual quest. 
Yet another reading of the closure of the section could be that the speaker will go beyond the stallion. It is true that now he experiences a psychological and a spiritual union with the stallion. It is true that he is sitting on the stallion, that he is hugging the stallion with his heels, that he has become in a way one with the stallion. But he intends to move further in his journey and he intends to unite not merely with one animal, not merely with the members of the animal kingdom, unite in a psychological, philosophical, spiritual manner, but with the entire universe, of which the animal kingdom is just one part, in which this stallion, this particular stallion is just one speck. The poet will soon attain the realization that he is part of the universe. He will be able to continue his philosophical and spiritual journey and identify himself completely with the universe, to unite completely with the entire universe rather than with a, with a single animal or rather than with the members of the animal kingdom. While scrutinizing the technical aspects of Song of Myself, section 32, I am impressed by the power, by the skill displayed by Walt Whitman as a free verse artist. We always say that the free verse revolution in the English language was ignited with the publication of the Wasteland in 1922 and every schoolboy is able to say that the father of free verse, I think free verse has more than one father, the fathers of free verse in English are T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound. But the fact is that Walt Whitman, who was born more than a century before the publication of the Wasteland, I think he was born in 1819, has written great free verse. And I have no hesitation in calling Walt Whitman the father, the real father of free verse in the English language, at least when I teach song of myself. It is only understandable that the markers of traditional verse are significantly absent from the present piece. There is no rhyme scheme. The poet refuses to follow the rules of meter. The stanzas are irregular. In fact, the poet seems to prefer long lines rather than short lines. The rhythms are prose-like. In fact, the whole thing is very unpoetic. And we must remember that Walt Whitman was writing this at a time when his senior contemporary, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, was producing lines like, Tell me not in mournful numbers that life is but an empty dream. 
I think I'm misquoting him slightly. Above all, there is a very close rapport between the technical aspects of the Whitman piece and the thematic aspects. It is not merely the technical aspects which are unconventional. The thematic aspects are also unconventional, very unconventional. Union between man and animal, kinship between man and animal, kinship between man and the entire universe. What is the title of the piece? Song of Myself, section 32. Song of Myself. Can you imagine Henry Wadsworth Longfellow writing a poem titled Song of Myself? Song, music, something which is very spontaneous, something very natural, something that comes from the heart and something which touches the heart. Song of myself, myself, the speaker referring to himself personally. Myself is the word that a speaker uses when he wants to refer to himself. Song of Myself, a very appropriate title. The speaker makes it clear that what we listen to is the voice of the soul of the poet. It is not a piece of literature crafted under the influence of external sources. On the other hand, the speaker says whatever he wants to say, it's a song. It is something spontaneous, something natural, something that comes from his heart and it is his own. We can listen to his individual voice, the voice of the speaker, which is very unlike any other voice. I think... Uh, Walt Whitman was quite aware that he was not a conventional poet. He was not a conventional human being. He was not a conventional American. He was not a conventional Christian. He was himself. And when we read this poem, we listen to that voice that comes from the soul of the poet, song of myself. It is possible to see the entire section, section 32 of song of myself as a soliloquy, the poet addressing himself. I think I could turn and live with animals and we are only overhearing what the poet says loudly to himself, oblivious of the fact that he is being overheard, because these are very intimate thoughts, these are very personal thoughts, these are thoughts which are very individual, which could occur only to a person like the poet. And I think it's better to see the entire section is a soliloquy where the poet shares his thoughts with himself rather than as a process of the poet sharing his thoughts with others. I think I could. I think I is an excellent example of anaphora. I stand and look at them long and long, long and long. A good example of anaphora. Anaphora is a figure of speech in which the poet deliberately repeats words, phrases, structures in order to generate a special effect. And we find several instances of anaphora in Song of Myself, section 32. Or look at the second stanza. They do not sweat, 
they do not lie they do not make rep repetition they do they do not is repeated and further down not one is dissatisfied not one is demented not one kneels not to his kind not one is respectable or unhappy i think that walt whitman has a remarkable flair for making use of anaphora and the entire section is studded with brilliant examples of this literary device the stallion that one meets with in the latter part of the poem is very much an animal in flesh and blood but i think it can also be seen as a symbol a symbol for the entire animal kingdom even a symbol for the entire universe a symbol for everything that man is not the stallion symbolizes power beauty grace innocence all those features characteristics that are found in human beings and that from the perspective of the poet impact in an extremely negative manner the character the personality the individuality of the human being are absent from the stallion so on the one hand the stallion is very much an animal in flesh and blood on the other hand it is a symbol a symbol for power grace beauty a symbol for the animal kingdom a symbol for the universe minus man a symbol for everything that man is not perhaps the most important metaphor in song of myself is the metaphor of the journey the journey in song of myself invites comparison with the journey in homer's odyssey and dante's divine comedy the journey is an extended metaphor in song of myself or when we read section 32 of song of myself we realize that it is no ordinary journey it is a journey which operates on several levels which functions on several levels of course it's a physical journey it is also a, an evolutionary journey it is a psychological journey it is a spiritual journey it is a philosophical journey and it it is in section 32 that we get a remarkable picture of the various facets of this journey metaphor did i pass that way huge times ago and negligently drop them this is a question but it's a rhetorical question a rhetorical question is a question which is asked for effect rather than for getting an answer it is actually a statement which is framed as a question in order to enhance its impact did i the poet says that he did we know that he did and we know that the poet means that he did but instead of saying that he did he asks did i a fine example of how walt whitman uses the technique of the rhetorical question the device of the rhetorical question in his poetry
Walt Whitman was a gifted nature poet. I think this is an area which has to be studied in depth. Walt Whitman could see a universe in a fallen leaf of grass, in a single leaf of grass. And in section 32 of Song of Myself, Whitman's love for nature is very powerfully manifest. His identification with the animal world his ability to establish a kinship with the animal world, his very personal love for the horse, for the stallion, his relationship with the stallion which is close, personal, sensuous. All these demonstrate that Walt Whitman is one of the finest nature poets in American literature. Personification is the figure of speech in which human characteristics, human features, human identities are attributed to non-human entities. I think it is possible to argue that Walt Whitman uses personification throughout this section of song of myself. The poet says that he wants to live with animals. He thinks that he could turn and live with animals. It is obvious that he sees animals as worthy of his company and himself as worthy of the company of animals. Just as an average human being desires the company of other human beings, the speaker in this section desires the company of animals. He tries to establish an equation of perfect equality between himself and animals, animals and himself. This is a case of personification where human identities are seen in animals. Towards the end of the section, we meet with the striking picture of the stallion. The stallion is certainly an animal, but the close kinship, the close rapport, physical, psychological, spiritual, that a speaker establishes with a stallion makes him Think of the stallion in human terms. It is significant that the stallion is not referred to as it, not its nostrils, but his nostrils. His nostrils dilate. Again, a powerful exemplification of the use of the figure of speech or personification. The poet makes use of alliteration or the repetition of consonantal sounds as in the second stanza where discussing is followed not long after by dissatisfied discussing and dissatisfied the poet makes use of assonance or the repetition of vowel sounds as in the fourth stanza, gathering 
and showing, gathering and showing. I would like to wrap up the discussion by recalling what Walt Whitman said about shoes. About shoes and also about poems. Walt Whitman said, A man makes a pair of shoes, the best pair of shoes. But even the best pair of shoes will ultimately wear out. There cannot be a dispute about it. A scribbler, a scribbler writes a poem and expects the poem to last forever. But the fact is that poems too wear out orphan faster than shoes. There is no doubt that this generalization has absolutely no applicability to the poems of Walt Whitman. The poems of Walt Whitman unlike the shoes in the story, are immortal works of literature which will last forever.